Good. Uh, so, so far we've been telling you what not to do, right? You said, oh, don't use lists, don't use trees, don't use maps, don't use if statements, whatever, right? So, uh, <laughs> yeah, but, but what should you do? How should you write your code, right? That is a much more difficult question, of course, because we can't give you just a list of here's what to do, because there is no list of here's what to do which uh, will lead to good code. I mean, following a set of rules unthinkingly does not lead to good code. I mean, I think that I can say unequivocally, uh, I mean, without any qualifications at all. So there is no such list. And anybody who claims to have such a list is out to get you hold on to your wallet, right? That's the, that, that's, that's the message. May I? Yes. All of you, <clears throat> all of you, of course, heard of famous letter by Dijkstra to ACM entitled, Go To Considered Harmful. Uh, by the way, he didn't come up with the name. Apparently, the editor did, who happened to be Niklaus Wier. So <laughs> it, it's, a, it's an interesting thing. Uh, but of course, Dijkstra is wrong. Go To is harmful when used inappropriately. Which is, all the rules have to have this when used inappropriately. Division is very harmful if you could replace it by shift. Uh, if you need to divide by seven, it's not harmful. You need to divide by seven. So if you need to do something, for example, if you would compute square root using pow, that's of course inappropriate. However, if you want to compute some other power, it is appropriate because there is, by the way, if you want to compute square using pow, desist. <laughs> right? So again, there, you have to think. Right? <clears throat> but all the rules, Param is absolutely correct. I mean, when you buy a book which entitled, uh, you know, 140 rules for programming in C++, or uh, 102 rules for using STL, there are books like that, uh, they tend to tell you nonsense. Huh? They let you tell, for example, all my life, or at least the last 20 years, every time I interview someplace, they ask me why your distractors should be virtual. Because the guy who interviews you read this book, and I have to explain that, sorry, I mean, I don't know about you, but I wrote a bunch of classes which people use, and none of their distractors are virtual. Not a single distractor in STL, by the way, is virtual. You're not supposed to inherit from them. So please do not, do not make things virtual. Again, I'm not talking about sort of whether you should use virtual functions or not. Again, there are two or three cases known to me when virtuals are useful. It's not often, but they could be useful. It's every time somebody comes and say, make all the virtuals, all the structures virtual, or make all your member functions virtual, or use inheritance, otherwise it's not correct. They, they are wrong. And again, if you said, use virtual structures where needed, I mean, yes, there are cases where they are needed, and there you should use them. But, but saying think. always is a step too far. Right. Right? So this is, this is the problem with sort of, you have to think, and people who peddle these books want to explain to you that you don't need to think. You just need to follow these rules, and you will become a good programmer. Right? I, I do not believe that. I think that to become a good programmer, you need to learn hard stuff. Again, algorithms and data structures. You have to read Knuth, which does not contain any rules, as far as I know. Right? Yes. There are cases where dividing by 7 is not best done by dividing by 7. It's best done by multiplying by some there, power yes. of 2 yes. divided by 7. Yes. yes, yes. There are cases. But there are cases where you're dividing, and this is a just, you know, you divide 7 here, 5 there. Yeah. So if you could get rid of division, I agree, get rid of it. This is why we're showing this table, showing how terribly expensive division is. And again, sort of, we have to, 
you know, all of us have to scream so that Intel guys will listen. Observe this terrible fact, which we, we sort of pointed before, that if you divide doubles, it's faster than if you divide 32 bit, uh, whatever. Integers, yeah. Integers, right? It, it is wrong because obviously double mantissa is longer than 32, right? They, they could put circuitry, but again, since nobody applying pressure to Intel, especially look at their horrendous numbers for in 64 we're switching to in 64 but there are no pressure. Customers are not screaming. Therefore, they're not doing anything. It's like if there is no pressure from the customer, all of, I mean, like if our customers will not insist on precision in our searches, we will not have precision. We are lazy. I mean, all of us, everywhere, Intel, you know. So nobody is trying to put pressure on them. That's why we get this horrendous numbers. Division is slower than square root. How could it be? Well, apparently somebody was putting pressure on the square root and we got it. I mean, so, Alex was talking about national labs, right? They are, of course, uh, they put a lot of pressure, but also they're, they're really challenging customers to have because they have no loyalty, right? And if, they if, don't care about integers. They have their code. If someone sells them a faster computer, they will buy it and run their code on that. They're if someone getting... gives them a compiler that's better that they have to change their code a little bit to use, they will probably do it. Yes, yes, right? absolutely. Yes. Does square root make the implicit conversion double? Well, all the square could... roots are done in terms of double. Yep. So that's because probably... that's, I mean, the, but observe that. It's, it's still square root. It's, I mean, it's doing something relatively significant. I mean, just convert takes about half the time of square root. <laughs> By the way, observe that it apparently doesn't matter. If you compare square root speed on double, where we do no conversion whatsoever. And in 64, where we do do conversion to double. In 64 somehow wins. Just just to show that you cannot you cannot predict much. You have to look at the data. Well, this one would be explained by the critical path rule as well. If your uh, not conversions this, not this going down. Well, going down. Yes, yes, I agree. I agree. But again, so, sort of what we are trying what we are trying to to show that first of all there is enormous. Again, sort of the thing to look at speed of addition versus speed of having one li serious library function is enormous. We're talking about two, I mean, over two orders of magnitude, close to three orders of magnitude. Three orders of magnitude? Three orders I mean, of magnitude. Three, I mean, some enormous factor of thousand, which is unbelievably slower. And again, we saw people using this POW in relevance codes. Maybe they need to. But again, you have to remember, it is almost like 1,000 instructions, which, which sort of, which you get. I mean, it's, it's enormously expensive. But so this, this is little thing, but sort of what we're trying to say, there are no rules. If you need to use that, you have to use that. If you need to use, by the way, when I'm starting to saying, do, you, do not use lists, do not use lists unless you must. Do not use maps unless you must. Again, what we're objecting is that people, without thinking, using the most complicated data structure, so always try to use the simplest data structure, that sort of the rule of economy. It's a lack of thought that's the problem, right? Even, yeah. for instance, even lists of 12 things to think about when you design your class. That could be a useful checklist, but not if applied thoughtlessly, right? You have to put some thought into it. 
You have to say, does this thing matter to me or not? And why is this thing important? Getting in the expensive library calls. I'm, I'm, I don't remember the story very well, but there was a, in strings, there was a case where Unicode was way slower than, you know, ASCII. And the, but for ASCII data, and so why is this? And it was because it was, you know, deep in the inner loop, it was checking if it was a Turkish, you know, doing something that was specific to Turkish. Um, you know, and you don't realize that when you're just, uh, uh, you know, just sorting strings or something. And yeah, so having in it, global flag which says no Turkish <laughs> might be a good solution. No, if, if you're doing stuff in, I mean, often if you're running grep, just uh, doing uh, uh, lang equal to c speeds it up enormously because that turns off all of that if you don't need it. Yeah. Well, if you set a, there's an environment variable that controls which locale you're in. If you set that to c, the c locale is basically ASCII. You know, skips all of the Unicode specific processing. So. Regardless, <laughs> okay. the important thing is you have to measure, uh, right? And you have to think, both. No, but um, right now we're switching to thinking. Right. Part. So the question is, how should we write good code, right? And someone will say, oh, you need it needs to be functional, and or someone will say it needs to be object oriented, or someone will say it needs to be aspect oriented, or you know, there'll be there are. Lots of different, I mean, so who do you believe, right? There are, everybody has their own methodology, right? But there is actually, there are some things that are universally accepted which do work, right? And uh, so starting with, in the 70s, there was this thing called uh, structured programming, which, uh, well, there was a result in the 60s which showed that with a small number of structures, you could do anything that you could do with GoTo's. And then people like Dijkstra and uh, Hoare yes. and uh, Wirt and, uh, David Grease, all of them, did a lot of advocacy and arguing and all that to sort of convince the entire community that structured programming is the way we should do things. And what is structured programming? I mean, we take it for granted today, but it's basically uh, divide your program into small pieces that can be easily understood, make them as general as possible, and have clean interfaces. Right? In general, that, that, that's the gist of uh, well, don't use go-tos, use, well, actually, structured programming was a little, uh, this, this, this is uh, more philosophical than that. Structured programming was more specific to, don't use go-tos, use structures like for, if, and then. But then other than that, they said the rest of it. Yeah, go ahead. However, Donald Knuth uh, published a nice little paper entitled Structured Programming with Go-to Statement. So just, just to tell you that there is no absolute rule. Sort of, Knuth realized that go to could be useful. No, it's, uh, again, it comes back to the issue is not what primitive you use. The issue is, is your code structured? You can structure it using go to's you, if you follow the right rules and have the right conventions. In some cases, if you're, you know, if you're an assembly language, maybe you want, and it, you might want to do it with go to's in some cases. Yeah. There is an old saying attributed to Ken Thompson that the fastest way of going from one place in your code to another is with the help of go to statement. And it is still true. If what you need is literally go from here to there, what I see very often, people would write if to jump around. Don't write if. If, if indeed you need to go to the end of your function. Go to is a perfectly good way of going. Have a label called end of function, or whatever you like to call it, or exit. That's, I think, a very sensible name. A label, and when you want to go to exit, you say, go to exit. Yes? There's but that nothing said, wrong about remember it. that I think Alex has claimed previously that in his life he has found, what, one or two? Two examples. Two examples of legitimate use of go to. So you should probably not be using go to unless you're really sure that you But need if it, right? you see. Because the, if you see that it helps, if it see that it makes your code easier to understand, do not hesitate. In 1987, my friend Dave Master and I published a book on Ada Generic Library, and in it we used GoTo in one place. Well, two GoTo's uh, in one place. And we were getting, yeah, 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 like that. That was the <laughs> loop structure. Yes. Uh, so 
we were getting angry letters. You know, like I got an angry letter from some uh, graduate student in Holland who wrote, don't you know that Professor Dr. Dijkstra proved that you should never use go to? To which I politely answered, yes, I am familiar with the Dijkstra article. Thank you. Uh, but people, people actually objected. They said, you're an ignorant bum. You know, how could you do that? And I know you know. But I mean, structured programming is a good thing. It's not the techniques. It's the structure. Structure is the important part. Right? And it's something that is sort of taken for granted almost. But think back to when you was just started programming. You probably wrote some long thing that got completely out of control and you couldn't understand. Or even these days, right? you start writing this three-line script which morphs into a hundred-line monster that is impossible to handle. That, that is what unstructured programming looks like. And I mean, so structured programming is a technique that is known to work uh, universally accepted as a good thing. And all of these different uh, strains of thought that I mentioned before will agree that it's a good thing. I mean, in fact, we, we haven't really, we see small glimpses of what unstructured code is like, but we haven't really experienced what that transition was like. I mean, I, I guess, Alex, you probably saw what code used to be like in the 60s, and then. Yeah, it was good. And what the, <laughs> how it changed, or what your personal experience was when you started using these techniques, right? Well, uh, one thing I could tell you, the amazing fact is that old code was better. Anybody could explain why? Because they have to have paid more attention because they couldn't have relied on those techniques. So this is also. There were very few programmers. They were very serious. They were much, I mean, you know, right now we're switching to this monkey Shakespeare metaphor. <laughs> sort of Google hires, what, 60,000 programmers. All of them are above average, of course. And they quickly type as fast as possible, and they generate, you could guess what. Uh, but it is amazing. You know, I was a few years back. Uh, my friend Paul McJohn, some of whom, some of you know him, uh, uh, got a permission from IBM to put System R, the first relational database system, the very major part of software history, to submit it to Computer History Museum, where they didn't put it really sort of everybody could see it. You need special disclaimer and submit blood sample and things like that. But you could take a look at it. So I took a look at it. It was amazing. It was an amazingly beautiful code. Right? Not just Paul, by Paul, but by sort of compare with what I see now. And that was something major, something industrial, something which changed the industry. I mean, uh, Larry Ellison admits that. Basically, his company came from ripping off IBM System R and sort of producing substandard version of it. But it, it was, he does, he does. Uh, so, but the code, the code was wonderful. It wasn't generic, it wasn't, you know, but it was very intelligent code, which it was very easy to understand. Right? I could read it. Of course, when you look who wrote it well, it was people like Jim Gray. It was, you know, one, you know, there, there was a higher level of programmers, and they took far greater pride in what they did. This is this is sort of, and it's not that they were even practicing structured programming. That was right at the point where sort of structured programming was appearing. But what happened is that eventually came two generations, two, two times, things sort of deteriorated. The first time, at least in my experience, was the switch from mainframe generation, when code was written by people by, like Jim Gray and Paul McJones, uh, to PC generation. Here comes a college dropout, one year at Harvard, doesn't teach you much, and starts the largest software house. Right? So, and there were many people I'm referring to. Bill Gates, for those of you, uh, right? So things dropped. You know, the quality of software moving to PC, to the desktop, dropped. You know, I, I'm talking about my, my perception. 
that when I moved from old sort of mainframe, even Unix kernel, to desktop codes when I started working for desktop company, com company, I was shocked. But then came another revolution. So those people hired college dropouts, but then came web revolution. And these people hired high school dropouts. <laughs> No, I, I am serious. You know, I know people who, who sort of started company out of Gunn High School in Palo Alto. Right? It's not that they're stupid, but you know, they're young. Right? So, and you know, indeed they started having these things. You hear we have them too called uh, who could hackathons. Hackathons. And we stopped doing it. They used to drink vodka while doing Facebook. They used to have these hackathons, and you know, you're supposed to drink after every line, and who could write, well, I, whatever. <laughs> I don't know, but that did not exist. People were serious. Sort of when I was starting, a typical program was a guy with a pocket protector who went to MIT, who drank jolt was the, the highest <laughs> sort of think, you know, it, it was a different world. So we have to remember that one of the things which we have to deal with is that enormous expansion of what used to be a profession turned into, you know, no longer a profession but a trade. And no longer a trade but I, I have no, I, you know, no personal remarks, but think about it. They hire anyone. There is a warm body on university. The recruiters running after him. <laughs> when I was starting, I'll tell you another amazing thing. There were no recruiters. You might not believe it, but there were no recruiters. No, nobody, I mean, companies had no recruiters. Now we have more recruiters by two orders of magnitude than research. You know, the companies used to have research. Now they don't have research, but they have HR department with like 50 people, even if you have 20 engineers. So it's, it's changed because they have to catch people who walk in university and drag them in. So it's, it's, a, difficult, it's a difficult situation. Therefore, it is our responsibility of each and every, not just mine, I'm out, as it were. You know. But it's your responsibility. If you want to be a professional, you have to change the field. You have to put an effort yourself, sort of the, the quality of code, the, the quality of documentation, the quality of algorithms and data structures is really up, up the standard. It's your responsibility. Or you will be part of this Facebook generation, drinking vodka and doing hackathons. Right? So this is, I, I'm just saying that do not expect them, that is management, to turn us into professionals. We have to become, I mean, it's, if I want to write good code, it's up to me. It will not come from Sergey Brin. For one very simple reason, he has no clue. I mean, he wants to design you know, glasses and cars. So code, it's your responsibility. We have to get, I mean, you know, my message before I die is code is important. You have to take it very seriously. You have to think about every single line. But I will continue. All right. So uh, how do we write good code? Well, so as I said, we advocate st a structured approach. And what does it mean? We've, I mean, we've been saying that throughout. But decompose your program into small pieces, make their interfaces clean and ge make them general and you know, make, keep them such that you can reason about it independently and build up your program out of these small pieces. Right? That, that is the approach. And that is universally agreed to be you know, the way to do it. There's, a, there's, there's, there's this question about what the pieces should look like, but you know, that's where the fashions are. I disagree with universally. Um, Nobody widely. cares anymore. Well, people who care. So regardless, so, uh, but structured programming is one of those things where you have to see it, you have to do it to realize. I mean, I tell you, OK, you need to decompose your program. Like, you'll nod your head and say, OK. But then when you start writing your code, how do you decompose your program? Right? You have to 
you have to do it a few times, you have to see it being done, and then you start seeing these blocks automatically. When, you, when you're writing your code, you'll say, oh, this thing is that. And I mean, that doesn't mean you don't have to think, but once you, you have to practice it, and then it becomes second nature. So the way we plan to do it is we will write some code together. We will, uh, uh, and hopefully, something will emerge out of that, and you'll you know, see at least some examples of uh, structured code. Uh, and what we're planning to write, uh, we'll start with just um, some simple examples of uh, simple data structures. But ultimately, the th main thing we want to work on is, uh, OK, so we've talked about how maps and hash tables and all those things are bad. right? But there's, there's one class of problem where we don't have good libraries at all. Right? And we're going to focus on one particular class of problems, which is variable-sized data types. Right? So the simplest example is, think of a UTF-8 string. Each character in a UTF-8 string can take up multiple bytes. Right? But let's say you want to write a count if, the same count if that I was writing before, on a UTF-8 string where each thing you get is a character. There is no unified frame. There's, there is no way to do it. Right? It, it, doesn't, it doesn't exist. How, how, you know? It's the same thing with, you know, we have a search engine that contains posting lists. They are differentially encoded. The integers are variable, variable length integers. How do you parse them? How do you intersect them? We have no generic way to handle data of that sort. Right? The only way we have is, oh, you can heap allocate each of these objects and keep a pointer to it. But that, of course, I mean, for small objects, I mean, that, that is not even worth talking about. Right? That is, that's not what you can do. Right? So, uh, so how, we have no good way of dealing with variable-sized data types today. Right? So we are going to develop a data structure that will uh, give you some ways of, of handling that and to sort of an approach that will allow uh, some of that. But before we get to that, we'll implement some simple data structures just to sort of um, show you what the overall approach is, what are the things we need to keep in mind when designing a data structure. Right? So that's, that's the approach we're planning to follow uh, in uh, the next few lectures. Let me, let me, let me interfere, sorry. Uh, Three steps. We want to do three steps before we finish the course. The first thing we want to do, we want to learn to implement something like a vector, maybe better than a STL vector. That's the most basic data structure. Why do we want to do that? You say vector exists. Well, first of all, the one which exists might not be as good as all of that. Now I have a right to say that. Uh, but second of all, it's the most basic thing. In order to learn to implement data structures, we need to start with the simplest. When I did STL, I was working for HP Labs. And there was a celebration. And uh, somebody comes to me and says, well, I mean, I don't understand why you guys are even celebrating. If you implemented oak till trees, then I would really be impressed. But all these vectors and lists, this is nonsense. So again, he is wrong. Uh, the simple things are things to learn. From. So first, we will try to learn how to implement vector, maybe simplified vector. Maybe a vector which is even simpler than vector. Fixed size. Fixed size vector or something. We will see. We'll see. Again, because. We do believe that every programmer needs to know how to implement data structures. Then, after we learn to do something simple, we will attempt, not attempt, we will succeed in implementing <laughs> something which does not exist, not in the standard library, but in general does not exist in any programming language. Every programming language right now deals with types of fixed size. Right? When you think about whether you deal with Java, whether it's boxed or unboxed, things are fixed size when they reside in an array. In C++ or in C, obviously, things are fixed size. If you say size off, you know what it is. But of course, it's a bogus thing. I mean, in reality, there are things which are variable size. We will attempt to do that. We will we will succeed, pardon me. Doing that, we will try to extend data structure framework to dealing with variable size type. That's our sort of research accomplishments in terms of data structures. Right? Then, 
We need to do something else. So we'll do data structure. What do we need to do after we do data structure? Algorithms. Because believe it or not, we were still sort of firmly convinced, now, no matter about what other people say, that programs are algorithms plus data structures. Right? So we will attempt to do an algorithm. And in some sense, algorithms are more important than data structures. The design of data structures is driven by what the algorithm needs. But for, we think that for, for presentation reasons, we want to do a data structure first. But you know, that's. Uh, yes, and we, we actually, the decision to do data structure before algorithm was made yesterday. <laughs> Literally, I, I, you know, we were sort of discussing whether we should do algorithm. And we will do one algorithm but we will do it in its full glory. We will try to learn everything about it and all the details of possible sort of imp implementation. Not all, we cannot do all, but lots of. And again, anybody will guess which algorithm we'll pick? Quicksort. Because it is the most glorious algorithm there is. So sort of we'll be talking about why it's glorious and who invented it and how when we talk about it, but we will concentrate on one algorithm. And again, sort of, we, we had multiple arguments, but I'm and I sort of, which al but unless we do an algorithm fully, it's, it's just not going, well, you know, the course will not be complete. And at that point, we will declare victory. And then there might be another course or not, but this is sort of the plan. We will do something like a vector. We will do this new data structure. We have a name for it. It's called tape because it is like a magnetic tape in some respect. So we'll do tape, and then we'll do quicksort. With all, again, we'll discover that quicksort has multiple, multiple little things on which it depends. So we'll have to implement bunch of other, for example, sorting algorithms to do quicksort because really good quicksort use, uses them. So, and then we will try to generalize it as completely as possible. For example, right now, those of you who know STL know that sort, which is an STL quicksort, requires what? Random access iterator. Yes, he knows. So should you, by the way if you intend to program. I know as of uh, two months ago. But, but the requirement is random access iterator. The assumption is that quick sort needs random access. Well, maybe yes, maybe no. We will find out again. We will see that as a matter of fact, requirements could be dramatically relaxed. How dramatically anybody could get? Why not input? <laughs> Well, because input allows you just to <laughs> read the data. It's very hard to, to shuffle it. I mean, you have to sort of, yeah. so yes, forward it to data. So we will make it work for singly linked lists. And by the way, do you think it's a good idea? Well, come on, it's a rhetorical question. <laughs> if we're going to do it, uh, we obviously know it's a good idea. And the merge sort, which is used for linked lists, is going to perform much worse. Right? So this is, we're going to show Believe you. it or not. Yes. So believe it or not, it could be done. I mean, you could make quick sort. There are like two believe it or nots here. One, <laughs> you can do quick sort on a linked list. And second, it, it's a good idea. <laughs> it's a good idea. <laughs> so well, I mean, it's, it's an interesting sort of thing. Again, we shall see. We shall see how, how to do that. So this is, this is, this is our goal. Uh, some people might say that, look, what you do, you do what you accuse others of doing. Because other people, they say, oh, you have to be functional. And other people say, you have to be object. -oriented. And you're going to peddle your kind of programming, generic programming. People always accuse me of doing that. Maybe they are right, but uh, I actually claim no, they are not right. Because from my point of view, what we are going to do does not depend, people say, oh, but you will use templates. Yes, we will use templates. But doing 
say, quick sort on linked list does not depend on templates. Let's face it, it's an algorithmic problem. How do you do it? Right? So again, we will use the technology which, which I prefer. You can fill in all the types and come up with something that is still a good data structure, except that it's not generic. But it's a data structure, what I claim, is generic, even if you have no templates of C++. Like the notion of a singly linked list is generic by its nature because, you know, it could be singly linked list of integers or doubles or some complicated structures or file descriptors, whatever. It is by its nature generic. And I mean, I, I personally view generic programming as a fairly natural extension of structured. I mean, because what were the structured programming people saying? Make it usable in the most uh, context th th that you can, right? And if, if, you're, if you're writing the same five lines for int as for double, why do you want to repeat them? If the compiler can fill in the type, why not? And this, is, this seems to me a fairly natural extension of what we know works already. And, but the interesting thing is when, when you start doing that, it turns out that uh, that leads to a lot of very interesting realizations about the nature of algorithms and types, which we will get to when we start writing code. But it's really a, I mean, it's really structured programming with, you know, some extra stuff. Yes and no. I always have to correct them. You know, <laughs> young generation, they need to be corrected. What is the difference? You see the structured programming crowd, however brilliant they are, and they were brilliant were trying to find a syntactic structure of code. This, they were trying to say, let's look at for loops with these kind of things. Let's look at while loops. Let us. And I think they overlooked one very fundamental point. It's about semantics. That is, you have to try to come up with semantic classification of components. And that is the difference between you know, if, if, if you sort of want. It's not just trying to find a good form. It's also trying to find a good meat, a good content. And then if you write, let's say, some, even something as simple as min or max in a generic way, you come up with very interesting questions like, OK, so what types can this work on? And, you know, and that leads to a lot of very interesting things, because that leads to uh, to start with, the notion of a regular type, which many of you have heard, but you may have the question of why, why are these requirements necessary on types? Well, you start writing those algorithms and you realize that to write any meaningful algorithm, there are some invariants that your object, your type must obey. Otherwise, it's just not possible to write those algorithms. And so a lot of these concepts that we otherwise would think of in a very ad hoc way become very clear when you, when you start doing this uh, activity. Yes, I have to agree with him occasionally, too. Uh, so uh, the practical thing is, first of all, let's start bringing laptops to, to here. Uh, we will try to do. Do we want laptops, or do we just want to write here? But we want them to participate in writing. So maybe do not bring laptops. But we will be using, we will not use this spoon, for those of you who remember that the previous course, nobody will be forced to write code. But we will be looking for volunteers. Like Hernan already said that he volunteers to write all the code at any moment, right? Yeah, so we have, right, we have some you know, upstanding citizens who are prepared to do that. But we, we, we want collaboration. We actually want to get to a point that everybody in the class understands Every single line, every single character which we write. Again, sort of if you're not sure why we call x x, complain. So why is it called x? Shouldn't it be called foo? And we'll have a discussion about whether we should use x or foo. By the way, it's not a vacuous discussion because for many years mathematicians were using x. And then a bunch of MIT guys decided that x and y should be replaced with foo bar, 
Were they right or not? Again, we will discuss. And for those of you who know Fortran, the original Fortran compiler, um, you hadn't actually, I don't think you could even declare any types because any variable that started with i, j, k, l, m, n was an integer because that's what you used for loops and everything else was a real number because that, that's what you were doing computation with, right? So uh, later versions, I think, added uh, other abilities. So names are important. And this led to the famous Fortran joke, uh, God is real unless declared integer. Just so, uh, but uh, in any case, we will, we will try to, to switch from lecturing more to, to writing code. And again, the goal is that all of you sort of participate and we agree. If we write something, we agree. If we do not reach consensus, we fail. Because again, sort of, I, I told you this story several times, but let me repeat it. In this wonderful, there is this wonderful story which Ken Thompson uh, quotes in his uh, Reflections on Trusting Trust. Reflection on Trusting Trust, which is his Tuning Award lecture. And he says that he was blessed to have a great collaborator, Dennis Rich. And then he says that they were so good that they would never attack the same problem sort of independently. So one will do this, another will do this. Except once when they both wrote the same program of 10 lines of assembly language. And they were identical. So that is the, the, the thing which shows you why these two guys were great. Because they, in some sense, they found a way of writing ultimate stuff, at least within their minds. The two great minds, both of them are, were remarkable. Well, one of them is still alive. Uh, you know, they were able to do that. And I claim it would be terribly nice, and it, it happens, for example, in, you know, with many of my collaborators, I reached sort of that level of mutual understanding. My, Long-time collaborator Dave Massa and I used to write code, and we would occasionally write the same routine, and we'll look, yeah, character, character by character, identical. Uh, and with Paul McJones, the same thing. So you could reach that. So I'm striving to create a consensus among people here so that we could write, say, quicksort or vector or whatever we write in identical way. So you take him land, send him to one corner, you take Param, send him to another corner, and they will produce the same thing. And the reason that if we, we are successful, I claim it's good because I actually believe that this democratic process, the fact that multiple people come with the same thing, is, is the, something which will show us that we are doing things correctly. Well, if we fail, we fail. Or we could even use Jack. Uh, that's a good idea. No, Jack no, is not a good idea. We could try. Should we start on pair, or should we do that next time? We have five, ten minutes. We can do pair. We can do pair in ten minutes, I think. No? Hernan, do you want to try? We should we start. We did singleton. But uh, maybe we start, I mean, <laughs> Let's do min. We did min before, but let's see if we remember min. Min, all right. Min. There is a function in the st standard library called min. Anybody knows what it does? <laughs> okay. Yeah, probably. Probably it finds a minimum of two guys. Could we do it? Okay, but you don't do no, it. No, I mean, I'm just. Yeah. Okay. How do we start? What is it? Is it class function? What? A template function. So we, we need to say template. <coughs> template. Yes. Uh, what, what comes after template? That's an easy, easy one. Yeah, an angle bracket. Okay, and 
type name C. Well, even that I do not like. No, I do not like it at all. I like T. I don't for sure do not like closing angle bracket. But uh, what kind of T? OK, let us think about it. Sort of what do we, what do we, I mean, what, what I mean, OK. Maybe this you should write the signature. tells you something. We are in trouble. Why are we in trouble? We haven't specified. Uh... Why are we in trouble? No, it's not because we're not specified. We, Oh, we could put anything. No, 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 no. But we're doing things the wrong way. Great rule, which I have been advocating for the last 20 years, 30 years, whatever, many, many years, is that you have been taught by your professors that you have to do top-down design. That you could somehow figure out from top-down how, how to specify things. I claim it's nonsense. You cannot do top-down design because you don't know what actually happens. My, I mean, my canonical example of top-down design is you design an airplane. And you say, we're going to have two components, lifting component and landing component. <laughs> and we will, of course, sort of assign Ryan to work on lifting component. <laughs> and Jack will be working on landing component. That's how management does it. I mean, you split. I mean, there are two activities, up and down. Yes. Is it going to fly? No. That's why things don't fly. Again, sort of fortunately, Wright brothers didn't know anything about top-down design. You have to figure out what is inside. So it's very important to really, before you figure out the interface, you say, but shouldn't we then Yes, you should do top down after you did bottom up. Sort of, you have to do, first of all, figure out what, what is the algorithm. Anybody knows what the algorithm is, by the way? Could we write code? Never mind template. OK, Hernan. What do we call them? Do we have choices? We have two choices. Yes, these are two choices. Right? Let, let us decide once and for all. X and Y. X and Y, why? It's a good choice, but let's explain why. It's a mathematical function, and mathematicians for centuries, at least since the time of Euler, decided that if you use A, it is a constant. And if it's a variable, it's X and Y. And you say, well, I mean, what do they know? Actually, they do know. They established a convention which we should not gratuitously break. I'm just trying to say that your intuition corresponds to some rule. So, so what do we do with this X and Y? X less than or equal to Y? No. Yeah, and I say it's bad. That's bad? Yeah, I say it's bad. Why is it? Okay, let me tell you why it's bad. I mean, I, I have people, and I want to find out who makes more. Or who makes less. And give him a raise. Which is, mean is well and defined as an algorithm even for different if we okay let us let us step back let's step back let's step back if i write write x less than y just for my sake if we write x less than y what what do, what do we mean by this glyph less than size think mathematically guys order it's a, what kind of order Total order, strict total order. Right? Why do I say that? Because some people say, oh, but maybe it's partial order. 
maybe it's weak water. Whatever it is, we'll find out what these things are. But why do we think it's a total order? Why our gut feeling says it's a total order? No, no, but there could be a weak order. This is good, but even what is the negation of less than? Greater or equal. Right? Which is, and that presupposes that two things, when they are, they either x is less than y or x is greater than y or x is equal to y. That is the axiom of total ordering, by the way. We shall see the difference. But we don't want to use total ordering here. Why? Because we don't have to. Because mean is very well defined for something which is weaker than total ordering. What is weaker than total ordering? This is a trick question. <laughs> no. Partial ordering wouldn't work, guys. Why wouldn't partial ordering work? What's the minimum two incomparable things? Exactly. An example of partial order is a parent. Yes? So a parent is greater than the child. But if you compare Param and Ryan, it doesn't work. As far as I know, Param is not his parent, nor Ryan is his parent. Partial ordering does not allow us to find mean. There is, however, a mathematical concept which works. It's called weak ordering. Right? Total ordering assumes, again, do we have time? We will, we will continue, those of you who, who want to look, look at that, but we will continue. So what, what I'm trying to say that we try to write mean for something for which mean makes sense. And that is mathematical concept of weak ordering. We will discuss what it is next week, if we're still alive. Yes. Uh, okay. we, guys, but by the way, if some conclusion we come up with, even like we say, well, we, we should really use foo and bar instead of x and y. If you so believe, raise your voice. Nick was supposed to argue for Fu and Bar. He comes from Fu and Bar Institution. <laughs> and Baz. <coughs> they use Baz as well. Yes, that's the third one. The third one. So it's not X, Y, and Z. It's Fu, Bar, and Baz. But they, they, it's actually MIT is amazing. Sort of. I spent my youth reading MIT code. And there, for example, all kind of marvelous identifiers. One which I like the most, which I think was invented by Guy Steele, is who knows? <laughs> so, you know, if you have a variable and you don't know what to call it, who knows? <laughs> <laughs>